Yes, ma'am. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Diapers and Degrees podcast. I'm your host, Victoria. And today we have a super fun episode. I'm so excited for today's episode. We are going to be talking with Pam Whitehead, or do you go by Pamela? Either Either way, it's fine. (laughs) Okay. And she um, is the president, I believe, of Love Line. Executive director. (laughs) Executive director. My bad. Um, But yeah, Pam, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. My name is Pam Whitehead. I'm the executive director of Pro Love Ministries. And Love Line is a project under Pro Love Ministries. And our founder president is actually Abby Johnson. Woo. Yeah, we love Abby. I I got to meet Abby. I actually got to meet all of y'all at the YWLS um, Young, yeah, that that leadership summit for women. So I met, yeah. yeah, that's how I that's how I was able to, you know, like, okay, I know, I know who Pam is. Um, and then I met Kelly and Nayeli. Yes. Yeah, that was so fun. And of course, Abby. But yeah, it was so cool to see just all the pro life booths set up and everyone, you know, learning about that. And so, yeah, so let's just jump right into it. Um, what is Love Line or what is Pro Love Ministries and what is y'all's mission in the pro life movement? Pro Love Ministries was started to uh, fill gaps in the pro life movement and build unity. And the way that we do that is we bring on, we affiliate with organizations who are already filling gaps. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, <laughs> if there are organizations that are doing something unique that isn't being done elsewhere. So uh, if you go on our website, our website is proloveministries.org. So when you go on there, you can see affiliates. Those are already established 501c3 organizations that we um, cover. So basically, awesome. we we help them with organizational development. Um, we help them with marketing. We help them um, with a platform. You know, we use our platform to forward whatever they're doing. But also they serve as a resource. So we use them as a resource. And then we have projects. And under our projects, these are um, things that we have spearheaded, that we started. And Love Line is one of those projects. That's awesome. Yeah, I heard about Love Line. I was before the conference. I forgot how, but I think because I was just involved. <laughs> I worked with Students for Life for a little bit, so I learned about so many different resources. And so I actually got to connect a few women to Love Line. Um, and so one of them actually... Um, right now I'm working with a young woman who's going through an unplanned pregnancy and she said that she reached out to y'all. So it's so easy, you know, they just text and then y'all go from there. So uh, tell me a little bit more about Loveline. Like what is that geared specifically to? Yeah, Loveline was started because um, to to really fill a gap. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the biggest reasons that women have abortions, well, more than 70% of women who have sought an abortion cite that they have a financial burden. And so we've got lots of organizations that help women and do a lot of things, but there aren't life affirming resources Mm -hmm. that specifically pay bills for women. And so, um, and provide what we would call comprehensive case management to women with multiple complex needs. Mm -hmm. Pregnancy centers do a great job of, you know, uh, helping women to choose life, showing them their ultrasound, a window into the womb, sort of, um, you know, turning them away from the idea of abortion and toward life, uh, providing parenting classes, uh, Mm -hmm. material assistance, um, helping them get on Medicaid and public assistance and those kinds of things. But uh, pregnancy centers, most of them across the country, that is changing, however, but most (laughs) of them have not historically helped financially by paying bills. And the reason is because there are a lot of social service organizations who do that kind of work, you know, within the Mm -hmm. community. If you look at community action um, or CAP, a lot of people have that within their own community Or um, there are just several organizations. You can go to United Way, and especially now, there's rent relief all over the place. Mm -hmm. The issue is that women who are facing an unexpected pregnancy and in crisis, there is a need that is um, urgent, you know? And so they need to get that need met quickly. Exactly. And if you're among, you know, 
other populations of people who are vulnerable, you're all vying for the same resources, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? It's like a race, a survival, yeah. a, a race to the finish. Um, she gets lost in that. Yeah. And so this, this is a, you know, our goal and our hope is to be able to help her quickly and serve her with dignity um, and connect her with everyone within her community who can do that. Yeah. A lot of what we do is vetting resources too. Mm -hmm. So we call ahead, That's you know, awesome. get her, yeah, yeah, we get her a yes. We make sure she's getting victories and not getting a bunch of no's on the mm -hmm. phone, you know? Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, it's, and the way it works, you want me to tell you how it works? Yeah, I love that. So yeah. um, we have a process and we, we try to get everyone into the flow of that process. So it starts with a text message. We say everything starts with a conversation. Mm -hmm. And today, the way people communicate is usually <laughs> through text yeah. or messenger, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we funnel everyone through our hotline. And that number is 888 five five zero one five eight eight and so we ask them to text and um they will text us and one of our uh, intake coordinators will answer respond and give them our, our name and say hey my name's pam um how can i help you today yeah. they tell us their name they begin to start and so we ask how old they are where are you located um are you pregnant do you have other children um are you safe if they indicate mm -hmm. that, you know, there's some violence or some other situation um, where their safety might be in danger, we ask that question. And then depending on the answer to that question, if it's, if it's yes, I'm safe, then we will schedule a phone call intake with them, mm -hmm. let them schedule it. If they say they're not, then we would get on the phone with them right away. Oh, wow. Um, awesome. So the next step after the texting, very little texting we send them to a phone call. The mm -hmm. phone call intake gets demographics, you know, all the basic information. They tell yeah. their story to us. We listen a lot. Mm -hmm. um, tell us their story. Um, we kind of make sure that they understand what to expect from us. Mm -hmm. And we tell them what we expect from them. And then, um, you know, what the process looks like. And they can commit or not. You know, mm -hmm. they get to decide whether they want to take this help. Yeah. And then if they say yes, they want to move forward, we assign a case manager. That's awesome. And that case manager meets with her through video call, just like you and I are meeting <laughs> right now. Yeah. And it's a lot more personal because it's kind of face-to-face. -face. Yeah. And so once they meet, uh, that case manager does a, a targeted needs assessment. And that needs assessment drills down to what her priorities are, like what's critical, what's most important right now. Yeah. What needs have to get filled right now? Um, and that's where we go. So that moment is when we make a request for whatever those needs are. Um, if it's financial and we can't find someone to fill it, you know, within the next three days, then we meet that need for her. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've learned so much. I mean, from like y'all social media posts and just the work that y'all do, it's really I, I bet it's, I bet it's difficult. It's challenging at times, you know, cause you're dealing with, you know, women who might not be in the best situation, but the fact that y'all are taking the time to do something so crucial for these women, but also do it well. And, you know, of course, like you said, like, listen and, um, just really love her. And I love that. Um, so I guess, is it, oh, I had a question. Was it, you mentioned, you know, if women had children, so is Loveline geared to specifically just, you know, women in unplanned pregnancies, it's their first baby, or is it also for, you know, single moms and um, that sort of thing? Yes. Actually, Loveline was started more for the single mom mm -hmm. than for the woman with the unplanned wow. pregnancy. Because pregnancy centers are available to help women in unexpected pregnancies, we actually just supplement their re their services. Yeah. So um, we usually with women who are facing an un unexpected pregnancy, we are not the primary service provider. Mm -hmm. The primary service provider would be the pregnancy center or those who are in her community. Yeah. Um, but women, uh, single moms, uh, mm -hmm. they need help. And, yeah. You know, how <laughs> sorry to love... interrupt you. I don't know if you know, but I'm a single mom. So yeah, <laughs> thankfully I have, you know, a lot of support from my parents and I I'm working right now. So, and I, I graduated in December. So like, I mean, that time even I couldn't imagine what it would be like if I you know, didn't have my support system. So sorry to interrupt you, but no, <laughs> go that's, 
okay because it's true you know mm-hmm. i mean and i think so many of us um don't i mean i know what it's like but there are so many people who come into this work who may mm-hmm. have always had support and they don't necessarily understand yeah and forgive me for this buzzword, but the privilege <laughs> that we have, you know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. You know, the mm-hmm. fact that we have support in our life is a privilege. Mm-hmm. It's not something we earn. Yeah. It's just inherent. You know, if mm-hmm. you have your mom and your dad, mm-hmm. I was a foster kid. Wow. So, you know, I didn't have that. So I had to yeah. learn on my own how mm-hmm. to live life, you know, yeah. um, and <laughs> it sucked <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Yeah. And I, that's why I'm almost 50 now and I'm just figuring it out. So I'm like, hey, <laughs> I can tell you what not to do, you know? Well, yeah. Well, praise God, you know, that we, <laughs> every, every moment in life is a learning step. And so for that's sure. awesome. Yeah. But you're a foster kid. Oh my, or you were a foster kid. Yeah. What was that like? And I guess along this conversation, conversation, like this part of the conversation, what led you into, you know, doing the work that you do now? Yeah, I, um, so I entered foster care when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, with my biological parents until I was eight. Um, my father was an alcoholic and he was terribly abusive to my mother, Mm -hmm. not to me, but always to my mom. So there's a lot of domestic violence in our household. And when I was eight years old, my father beat my mother to death and that, um, he went to prison and um, we went to foster care. Mm-hmm. Uh, the home that we entered into was not good. Mm-hmm. Uh, they took all four of us, which seemed like it was going to be great. Because mm-hmm. um, no one else, like our family was very poor. Our biological family was very poor. And no one could take all four of us. Yeah, You know, one could take the baby. One could take mm-hmm. the three-year-old. One could take the five-year-old. One wow. could take me. And... um you know, so the court wanted to try to keep us together. And there was this mm-hmm. family who said they would take all of us. And so, you know, that seemed like the best option. Mm-hmm. And honestly, looking back, I am grateful that we were all together because it did make life a little more. Um, <laughs> it, it made it a little easier, at least yeah. to have my brother and my two sisters there. And it kind of gave me a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was terribly I was tormented emotionally and mentally and I was physically and sexually abused for 10 years Mm -hmm. in the foster home so when I graduated high school I turned him in Um, I wanted to be in a position I had planned made a plan Mm -hmm. and I turned him in when I graduated wanted to be in a position to help my brother and my sisters yeah before I did that Mm -hmm. Um, so I turned him in and he went to prison wow and so uh and then my adulthood began. Yeah. Well, praise <laughs> God I, that he was, you know, that justice was served. Yeah. You know, and wow, just hearing that, that's an incredible, you know, testimony yeah. of just how, you know, even at that age, I'm not sure, you know, uh, you know, when Jesus exactly came into your life, but. It you wasn't know, like, then. Yeah. <laughs> But you still held on to, you know, like, this is my family and I'm going to do something to protect them. And wow. Okay. Sorry. Continue. No, it's okay. (laughs) I, you know, there was always this innate knowing that, I I mean, we all have a personality and it's God given. Um, And I think so often some of us, when we become a Christian, we think we've got to change our personality and that's not <laughs> true. You don't have to change your personality, but what he does is he refines our character. Amen. So my personality has always been that I've been a justice seeker. Yeah. I've always sought for what is right, what mm. is good, what is helpful, you know, what is not mm-hmm. harmful. Um, that's since I was a kid. And I think it's because of what I grew up in. Yeah. Uh, when I would see what was happening to my mom, I was always the one that would be there to comfort her, which mm-hmm. is not healthy, but mm-hmm. it, it is the way it was, you know. Mm-hmm. And then in in our foster home, I was the oldest of four. And so I'm the one who's, you know, uh, standing up for my brother and my sisters, taking mm-hmm. the brunt of everything so that they didn't have to endure it. And so there was always this kind of 
you know, personality and character <laughs> trait that I had. And I am very fortunate that I've seen justice served, you know, more than once in my life. Yeah. Um, and I know that everyone doesn't get that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that can be a driving force for anger for mm-hmm. a lot of people. Um, and I think sometimes that's what we're seeing a lot in our yeah. nation today yeah. is uh, people with um, unresolved conflict mm-hmm. in their own soul. And, you know, that's what we need to pray for is that reconciliation would happen. Amen. And those of us who are <laughs> ministers of the gospel, those of us who know Jesus, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And yes. I think that is the greatest gift that we can give people is to reconcile them to God. Mm. And when that happened for me, everything changed in my life. I went through a lot between the time I left my foster home and when I surrendered my life to Jesus. There was 18 mm. years. Wow. 18 yeah. years between that time. So I lived 18 years under underfoot, you know, basically mm-hmm. in subjugation to all of this uh, torment and physical and sexual abuse in my life. And then I lived 18 years without Jesus wow. on my own, trying to trying to make my own decision. So yeah. two full adult lives, <laughs> all right? Oh, goodness. Are becoming an adult. Yeah. And it's so interesting that when I surrendered my life to Jesus, it had been 18 years on my own. Wow. But I had an abortion in that time. I became mm-hmm. addicted to drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. I became very promiscuous. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in the military. I wow. joined the army. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and while I was in the military, I was sexually assaulted more than once. Oh so I have military goodness. sexual trauma. Wow. Um, you know, so I had all these things, uh, but. Trauma drove all of my Mm decision-making for all of that time. And that's one of the reasons why at Loveline, we provide therapy at no cost to women. Say say that again. At Loveline, we provide (laughs) therapy at no cost to women. That is amazing. Oh my goodness. I need to shout that that from the roof. Because when I look at, I mean, God didn't put me in this position for no reason. Amen. I'm not someone who's got a social work degree. I'm not someone who should be doing this on paper <laughs> when yeah. you look at it on paper. But God absolutely put me here and mm-hmm. he gave Abby the wherewithal to put me in this position yeah. because of the experiences that I faced and the needs that I had that didn't get met. Amen. So when I look at all of the you know, bad decisions, you know, or decisions that didn't work out, the decisions that had negative consequences for me in my life, Mm -hmm. I can trace them all back to trauma, Mm -hmm. you know, based on a a trauma response. And so if we can get these women healed from their, their, their history, you know, whatever's hurt them, um, instead of asking someone, you know, why did you do that? Why did you make that decision? Instead Mm -hmm. say, Hey, what happened to you? Mm, you know, or who yeah. hurt you, you know, wow. cause hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. That's so true. When you see people lashing out and making dumb decisions, you know, it's like, Hey, what happened? Like, how did we get here? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And when you listen and let someone tell you that story, you can hear the need yeah. and inevitably the need is always healing of the mm-hmm. soul. Amen. And so if we can do that, then we will absolutely change a life. Wow. The trajectory of someone's life. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh my goodness. This has been such an encouragement to me so far. You, you're you just glowing. Like whenever, <laughs> I mean, I, I just started going to this new church. I'm in, I'm in mm-hmm. like the North Dallas area. And so on Easter, they had a couple members of the church give their testimony and just, you know, just like yours, you know, horrible childhood, went through horrible things, but like you would never know because that's the light of Christ that's in you. And it's just beaming through. (laughs) Um, I did want to ask you a little bit more about, you know, your abortion and Mm -hmm. um, what it's like, um, what that experience was like, because I know that I have a few friends who unfortunately made that decision. And um, that's another goal of mine is, you know, to also encourage women and also, you know, help you know, prevent them from making that decision. So you can come help with us at Loveline. (laughs) I would love to. (laughs) So I had an abortion in, uh, on September the 8th, 2001, mm-hmm. I was 13 weeks and four days wow. pregnant. 
Uh, so I was pretty far along. Yeah. I had already had two children. Oh, wow. I was 28 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew full well what abortion was going to do to my baby. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what abortion was going to do to me. And I think that that's the issue that a lot of people have today. Mm -hmm. While they recognize that abortion is killing a life, mm -hmm. they don't acknowledge the harm that abortion does to women. And if we are pro woman and if we are truly going to be this new wave of feminism, and if we are going to be all for women's empowerment, then mm -hmm. we need to acknowledge the harm that abortion does to women. Yeah. And abortion harmed me greatly, not just emotionally, not just mentally, but physically. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor perforated my uterus and I hemorrhaged. Oh and for 25 minutes, they packed and tried to stop the bleeding and they couldn't and they had to call an ambulance. So I walked into that abortion clinic standing up, but I left in the back of an ambulance with no mm -hmm. sirens and no lights out the back door where no one knew. Wow. That's insane. And oh my goodness, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, well, and the thing yeah. is the, 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 you know, Roe v. Wade just got overturned. Praise yeah. God. Amen. Yeah. But abortion isn't over. Yeah. Abortion hasn't ended. This hasn't mm -hmm. abolished abortion in America. What this has done is it's brought it back to the States, which means we as people, Mm -hmm. of good faith and conscience can now vote and decide whether or not we want abortion in our state. Mm -hmm. And so we need to get active in the legislative process. We need to understand. Yeah. We need to see who we're voting for. We need to know how they vote yeah. on the issue. We have to determine what is it that I am going to stand for mm -hmm. when I'm voting, what matters the most to me? Yeah. What am I willing to not compromise on? Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to decide. And for me, life is the one thing that I'm unwilling to compromise on. Mm -hmm. I'll compromise on the environment. I'll <laughs> compromise even on health care. I'll compromise mm -hmm. on, you know, some of these other issues that are variables. Mm -hmm. Honestly, they're not absolutes. They're always yeah. changing. Yeah. Right. But life is an eternal issue. Amen. For and, sure. and so for me, that is one thing that I will not compromise on. So yeah. whoever I vote for has to vote for life. Yeah. I In totally the womb. <laughs> in the womb yeah i mean because without if we don't have life in the womb there wouldn't be all these other you know health care and all that stuff like there wouldn't be anyone to provide health care for and so i totally know what you mean like in um you know in just the work that i was doing with students for life it was so easy to see a lot of people kind of not just influencers and kind of like big speakers in the conservative area, but just in general who like come out as professing Christians and things like that. And it's so sad to see that they don't, they're willing to like voice all their issues, you know, give their opinion on all these other issues. But when it comes to life, they're just so scared. And so, you know, it's just so encouraging, you know, you, like you said, you've always been a justice seeker. And so you're like, no, this is the one thing that I'm not going to move from. And so, that's just awesome. Um, it wasn't always my stance. Mm. Oh, really? You know, I mean, yeah, obviously it wasn't because I chose abortion. Oh, yeah. That's when, true. Yeah. When I chose abortion for myself, um, my circumstances drove that decision. Yeah. And then when I looked at my circumstances and I looked at my history mm -hmm. of dealing with life on life's terms, all I heard was you can't. Mm. You can't. And so then I ask everyone in my circle, what should I do? Oh, Pam, you can't, you can't. Mm. And so I think that's the mantra of abortion. You can't. Yeah. yeah. That's what abortion says. Yet we're taught, we're saying that this is women's empowerment. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. It, I am an empowered woman and <laughs> I don't take you can't from anybody. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Right. So why is it that we are allowing this to be the answer. We can mm -hmm. do anything. We can mm -hmm. have our baby. We can have our dreams. I mean, look at you. My goodness. <laughs> You've overcome and accomplished so much. Like you are mm -hmm. the walking billboard for <laughs> you can. Right? <laughs> yes. Amen. For sure. And yeah. It's, yeah. Just you saying that I, um, 
like that was what my child's father was telling me is that you know like i want you to have a good life and have a good college you know experience and all this stuff and essentially he was saying you know you can't do that while also having a baby and so and like it's like no you're not you're not gonna tell me that <laughs> and i was very stubborn as a teenager and so the lord really used that for his glory and and i remember telling him i'm not gonna do that it doesn't matter how hard it's gonna be i'm gonna make sure that you know i take care of this child and i give her the best opportunity uh, that she has for life because like there's no other way for me and so um i think that's a really important message that women need to hear is that they no matter what their circumstances are and no matter what they look like, you know, there's always hope for the future. And even if you don't see it yet. And I remember so many times in college, like even just graduating seemed like miles and miles away, but like finally I made it. And now it's like, Oh my goodness, I actually did this big thing, not just for myself, but for my daughter. And that puts her at a greater advantage, like in life, you know? And so that's just awesome. But yeah, yeah I, it's, it's, you know, I think, when I look back on that decision and when I made it and why I made it, mm -hmm. you know, also my addiction drove my decision. Oh yeah. Um, I was an, a drug addict and an alcoholic. And when you're in addiction, you're very selfish. Mm -hmm. I can speak for me. I was very <laughs> selfish. I wanted what I wanted and I wanted it now. And the thought of, of having another child when I couldn't take care of the child that I had, you know, all the things, these things were running through my head. The truth was I did not want to accept responsibility mm -hmm. yeah. for this situation. Uh, I was, you know, I rationalized my decisions and, mm -hmm. you know, part of that was that, well, nobody's going to help me, you mm -hmm. know, or this or that, you know, and the truth was there were people likely available to help me. Mm -hmm. I just had not asked the right people. Yeah. So I literally, the people that I asked around me were going to confirm what I was mm -hmm. already thinking. Yeah. So it's so important that we have people in our lives who aren't just going to agree with us in our misery. Mm -hmm. People yeah. who will tell us the truth and stand up and tell us what's best for us, Amen. not what we think we should do or what, you know, feels good. Yeah. But people who will will honestly tell us, no, you know what? You don't have to do that and I'll help mm -hmm. you. Yeah. You know, um, it's so important that as women, if we want to empower other women, if we want to stand up for life, the way that we do that is we start with the women who are already in our lives. Yeah. Amen. Who have children, mm -hmm. you know, like who's babysitting for you? <laughs> you know what uh, I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like, which friend do I have who's actually standing up and, and willing to help me and being like, hey, you know what, Victoria, you got to go to the grocery store. Why don't you let me watch your daughter? Or, hey, <laughs> better yet, why don't you guys go to the pool and I'll go to the grocery store for you? <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah. But um, just simple things like that for single moms mean yeah. the world. Yeah, that's awesome. And there's and an see amazing ministry that so many people don't know about. I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. There's an amazing <laughs> ministry that I don't think a lot of people know about. I think it's a hidden what gem what is that it? What people is it? need to know about. And so it's a secret. You want to know? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm it's like a called... resource awareness junkie. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. I am too. It's called the life of a single mom okay. dot com. So you should really interview Jennifer. She has an amazing okay. story. I'm her writing it is, down right now. Yeah. Her name is Jennifer Maggio. She spoke at our pro-life women's conference in Memphis last year. Mm -hmm. And um, she and I kind of have hit it off really well. But um, what she does is literally what people say that we don't do. Mm. <laughs> it's been there for mom and 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 child after baby's born, yeah. you know. And so, you know, we've got pregnancy centers that do their part. Yeah, we've got Embrace Grace, which does a great job yeah. of you know helping women. They're a gateway of hope for women mm -hmm. to get connected to a church. The body of Christ mm -hmm. is who surrounds women, you know, and helps edify them, encourage them, lift yeah. them up. And then the life of a single mom, because sometimes once you get in a church, mm -hmm. you still feel alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as a single mom, you feel like everybody's all married and, you know, mm -hmm. living their all like godly <laughs> life and stuff. And, you know, I'm over here, this sinner who's, yeah. you know, who everybody knows. And, I mean, that's how we, I felt. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, 
I don't have anything in common with these people. Yeah. But the life of a single mom creates groups that uh, are for single moms, for oh. single moms to talk about their issues, to be real about the things that they're facing. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, the leaders of those group provide godly examples and wisdom yeah. for women to overcome life's challenges. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a great place. The life of a single mom. And they also have single mom university. That's which awesome. Is, <laughs> yes. All these classes that women can take on finances and relationships and boundaries and, and boundaries yes. and boundaries. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all I, the good stuff. I hear you. So, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Um, one of my last questions is, um, okay, so, you know, we went through your childhood and kind of before Jesus. So what is your life like now that you, you know, know Jesus and, and of course, <laughs> after all the trauma, what is life like for you? I have hope. Mm. I lived a hopeless life for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's like the light was snuffed out. Like I was sitting in the dark always, mm -hmm. but not as an adult, but like a little five-year-old kid sitting in the yeah. dark, not knowing if anyone was going to come and rescue me. Mm -hmm. And that's how I felt most of my life. But when I called on the name of Jesus, I had a radical conversion and everything changed for me. It was like light shone into midnight yeah. and it's never gone out. Um, I've been on fire for God since the day I met his son <laughs> and, um, that was 2009. So what is that? 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, that, that fervor you have, it'll run out, you know, you'll get <laughs> to a point where, but if you know that the very breath that you breathe is only because he allows it. Then, I mean, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to God. I'm so grateful to the person who invited me to church. Like no one preached the gospel to me. They didn't like come <laughs> up to me and witness with a tract, you know, and try to like convert me. Yeah. It was an invitation. And yeah. that's how simple it is. Like just mm -hmm. invite someone and I was hurting. I was in a place where, you know, my husband was addicted to drugs at the time. I was sober. I was five years sober mm -hmm. when I got saved. Um, and I was trying to do it all in my own willpower. I was agnostic mm -hmm. for most of my life. And so, you know, I knew I wasn't God, but I was trying to be. And <laughs> it wasn't working out. Um, and I was trying to do that in my marriage, you know, yeah. um, and my husband was still struggling with addiction and I would point my finger at him and, <laughs> you know, I did it. Why can't you do it? That kind of thing. And trust <laughs> me, that doesn't work. It doesn't work with addiction and it doesn't work with single moms. It doesn't work with moms and unplanned pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Just because I did it doesn't mean she can do it right now mm -hmm. without help. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And that was the truth. My husband couldn't do it without help because I couldn't do it without help. Mm -hmm. And I needed a helper again. And Jesus came through. I'm telling you. And I got, I got baptized in the Holy spirit in January of 2010. And for Woo! me, that was when everything <laughs> changed. Um, yes. The power that came into my life, the power to be a witness, a good witness, the yeah. power to overcome sin, the power to go to Walmart, <laughs> just to be around people, you know, y'all ever seen that like meme that says, you know, yeah. you know, the well, Holy Spirit well, go to Walmart. <laughs> That's me. Like, I, I mean, just, yeah, you're not wrong. You know? And so uh, for me, that was, that was everything. And I don't know how people live in this world today without, without faith in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. because there is no hope. He's the hope of glory. Like there's no, there's no hope. If this is all there is, what in the world yeah. is the point? Exactly. You know, the truth is this is like that much mm -hmm. of your life because we are made for eternity. Amen. Ephesians, yeah. I mean, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that he put eternity in the, in the heart of every yeah. human being. And so we are always seeking to get back to that place where we know that we'll live eternally with our father mm -hmm. in heaven. 
And the only way that we're going to do that is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through him. Amen. And (laughs) yes, like if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, (laughs) look, that door is going to be closed. (laughs) You know? Yeah. I heard a preacher one time. He told this great story. He said, you know, you know, a lot of people love Michael Jordan and they talk about Michael mm, Jordan, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and no stats about Michael Jordan, like know everything about his life. You yeah. know, you watch the um, ESPN, um, you know, the mm-hmm. last dance. And so, you know, everything <laughs> about him. And uh, so, you know him, you know him, you know all about him. But if you walked up to his house and you knocked on his door, would he let you in? And it's the same way with Jesus. I may know him. I may even read the word, right? Yeah. You know, but am I intimate? Do I have this relationship? Do I know God that way? Do I know his character, his attributes, his desires? Are his desires my desires? You know? Yes. And when I walk up to the door, does he know my name? Mm -hmm. He's going to be like, hey, look. Look who it is. Yeah. <laughs> and had throw a party. Or is it gonna be like, ooh? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. And so I like, heard that preacher, yeah. I was like, ooh, that's good. <laughs> like, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> yeah, it was true. No, it's just yeah. so simple. hmm And yeah. like Jesus, even when we think we've done the worst. He's he's still there waiting for us. I remember one time in um, college, I was in, involved in, mini- in college ministry. And so um, one of the guy leaders one time was saying, like, when you go to the Lord, you don't have to go like a dog with the, your tail in between your legs. Like, it's just like, I mean, he's your heavenly father. You know, you can come to him. And so, like, that's how I see God. I don't know. I feel like the Lord talks about us being his children. So I always, I'm always like, okay, God, hi, I'm back. (laughs) Yeah. But of course with a humble heart, you know, and wanting to do, you know, correct my mistake. And then he's there gentle and patient and kind. And so that's awesome. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, there's nothing that we can do that will ever make him love us any less. Amen. And there's nothing that we can do that can make him love us any more. Yeah. So our performance, while it is proof of Mm -hmm. our faith, our performance is not going to gain us any sort of recognition in the eyes yeah. of the Lord. Yeah. You know, he's no respecter of persons. Yeah. Like I, I, you know, I look at my life and I think, why do I get to do this? You know, how is it that I end up in this <laughs> position and that I get to do this? Like I'm not supposed to be here. And mm. if, if people can't look at that and know that God is real, like I'm not, I'm a fool. I'm not supposed to be able to do any of this. Mm-hmm. And um, the fact that I am is only because of the grace of God. Amen. Yeah, for sure. Well, Pam, oh, you're amazing. I wish I could giving you a virtual hug. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, I'm so glad we got to meet. Maybe we'll get to see each other again. Are you going to the America Fest? What is that? Or do you just oh, do the Dallas for? Um, well, I don't work with students for life anymore. Okay. I, yeah. Um, but I've been, now that I'm doing this, I, you know, I want to grow, I want it to grow so that I can reach, you know, a lot of young women, of course, women of all across the spectrum. Um, so hopefully maybe we'll see. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so really quick, um, if anyone wants to find Pearl of Ministries, get involved, where they, can they go to do that? So we have a volunteer tab. The best place to volunteer would be Loveline. Uh, so if you go to loveline.com, there is a, um, get involved, I think at the top, I'm not looking at it, but it's, it's very obvious when you see it. Mm -hmm. And then under that, it says volunteer and you'll fill out that application and, um, or you can just email me because you may not want to be a case manager. Maybe you want (laughs) to do something else, right? Yeah. And that volunteer, that application is really just for case managers. But we've got all kinds of opportunities. We can plug people in. We always feel like if someone reaches out to us to serve, then Mm -hmm. it's likely that uh, God called them to it. Because no one wakes up one day and decides that they want to, you know, end abortion. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. It's not like, you know, it has to be a call for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and then what are your social media handles outlets where people can find y'all online 
who we are on TikTok. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wait. Yes, yes. I've seen you on TikTok. So I have a TikTok. Don't go to that one because I'm a <laughs> fool. Uh, but Loveline has a TikTok. I think it's loveline.hotline okay. on TikTok. And we have an Instagram. Um, and now the Instagram and Facebook icons are on our website. So you can okay. click on that and follow us there. Um, Instagram is loveline.hotline as well, I think. Um, or is it? It may uh, have our phone number in it. Yeah. I Yes, I do remember yeah. seeing that. But either way, it's on the website. Like the little icon is at the mm -hmm. top. So you can click there and get to that. And then, of course, we're on Facebook, which I know a lot of you young people don't really get on there that much anymore. Um, but for I still have Facebook. Over 35 <laughs> is on here. Um, we are on Facebook. And Facebook actually is where we post a lot of our baby registries mm -hmm. that we share for women and a lot of the needs because awesome. it's just more open to us sharing links and that yes. kind of thing. So awesome. we don't have enough followers yet to be able to do that <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I, I totally feel you on that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pam, for um, being on this episode of Diapers and Degrees. I look forward to hearing or to meeting you, seeing you again. Um, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and click stop recording. <laughs>